the ovaries, if they're not ovulating, we start having these anovulatory cycles. So you might still be having periods, but if you're not ovulating, it means you're not producing progesterone to balance out the estrogen. So that can drive a lot of the symptoms that we associate with menopause, like the hot flashes and the mood changes and the breast tenderness and the sleep disturbances. Progesterone is a very calming hormone. It's a very sleep promoting hormone. But if you're not ovulating, you're not producing it. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Adaptive Zone podcast. My name is Matthew Boyd. I'm a physiotherapist and running coach. If you enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're so inclined, share it with a friend. Today, we're going to be talking to Michelle Lyons, who's a physiotherapist who specializes in women's health and pelvic health. And we're going to be talking all about specific considerations for runners around the time of menopause. And this episode is very much something that shines a light on a lot of problems that aren't well treated, aren't well recognized. And so if you are around the age where perimenopause might be a factor or menopause, or, you know, for the male listeners, you know, you're going to be married and have relatives who potentially could be having some of these symptoms. Really, today's episode and, and a couple of my recent ones and another couple that I've got coming up around these sort of women's health, pelvic health kind of issues are really trying to raise awareness because these are things that are not well recognized, as I said, and not well treated. So I don't want to go on about it too much because uh, Michelle does a really good job of giving us some context and, and some things to look out for. So I'll leave that to Michelle once we get into it. And if you are enjoying these episodes, please don't forget to check out my online course. It's a free course and it's called the Running Fundamentals course. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's designed to teach runners the fundamentals of running performance. I also touch a little bit on how to avoid injuries, running technique, energy systems, training zones, and other sorts of things. It's completely free. I put a lot of work into it. I think it's really good. And I've had some really um, good feedback on it from people who've been through it and, you know, sent me emails from all over the place and, and people seem to be getting a lot out of it, which is, you know, really exciting for me. So I hope you guys check that out too. Just click the link in the description, click uh, enter your information and you'll get one email a week with each module with links to a video, audio version and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, again, that's enough out of me. Let's get into it. So Michelle Lyons, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Adaptive Zone podcast. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really looking forward to our chat today. Awesome. Uh, so before we get into it, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional work? Absolutely. So I qualified, um, as my daughter likes to remind me, in the latter part of the last century as a physiotherapist. And originally, uh, my work was in sports medicine and ortho and all things musculoskeletal, working with high level football players. And then in the year 2000, um, I'd been out for a couple of years at this point, I had my daughter and I did not have a great obstetric experience. And I really just found myself thinking there has to be a better way that we can help women live well during this huge transition into uh, maternity. So I switched gears completely and really started focusing on women's health and particularly pelvic health. And I suppose really over the past 22 years, that's been my passion, uh, focusing on pelvic health with a, with a dominant focus on women's health but trying to bring in some of the musculoskeletal, the sports uh, interest into that as well. And then also expanding into a little bit of oncology rehab, because I think oftentimes what can happen is with people who are going through that cancer journey as well, their pelvic health needs get left behind. So I suppose it's all about the pelvis for me and all the different influences as we go through life that can affect the pelvis. So I've added to my toolbox over the years, I've done Pilates and yoga teacher training. I've done a postgrad in health coaching and nutrition. And really just trying to, to help women live well um, and not be overcome by barriers to living well because of issues to do with pelvic health. Okay, excellent. So we are going to focus specifically on your expertise in menopause and perimenopause even more specifically. So if we could start there just by defining some terms, because we're going to be talking about this in specific reference to like an athletic population, so a running mm -hmm. population. But if we think about... Um, what what is the menopause and and how does that contrast to perimenopause? Sure. 
So I suppose there is a lot of confusion about what these terms actually mean. And the the definition of menopause is it just means it's been 12 months since you've had a menstrual period. So technically menopause itself lasts a split second because it's been 12 months. That was menopause. Now you're postmenopause. So you don't actually know you've gone through menopause per se until 12 months after the fact. Where we see a lot of the signs and symptoms that fall under the menopausal umbrella is actually in perimenopause. And that can be anywhere from 10 to 15 years leading up to that last menstrual period when hormones can get a little bit roller coastery. Um, we start seeing some really big fluctuations, particularly with hormones like estrogen and progesterone. And that's going to have a lot of effects um, when it comes to athletes and, and all types of athletes, not just runners. Because, of course, estrogen and progesterone affect muscles, they affect tendons, bones, joints, connective tissue, but they also affect sleep and mood and metabolism. And I really think it's great that we're starting to see this awareness, this growing awareness now of the effects of perimenopause and menopause on musculoskeletal function. You know, menopause is more than just hot flashes. Um, and there's so much that we can do to help women live well and keep exercising and keep moving during these transitional times. And I think it's really important because it's it's the magic pill when it comes to, to staving off ill health in later life. So anything we can do to support women moving and enjoying movement is really, really important. Yeah, and as you mentioned, that is a, there's a wide variety of, of symptoms and things that it affects. And I guess that's why I sort of got more interested in it recently is it just kind of kept coming up, you know, as I <laughs> learned a little bit more and I was... I'm working with runners who are in the perimenopause or postmenopause mm -hmm. period and thinking, oh, well, how, how relevant are these hormone changes to their current Achilles problem? You know, or is it yeah. uh, something else? And then you start asking them other questions like about fatigue and mood and things. And then you're like, oh, man, there, 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 there might be more things going on here. And then teasing out what is hormonal changes from what might be yeah. other causes, I think, is potentially something we might have to get into a little bit Absolutely. later. But it's <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? It does have a lot of um, effects. Layers. Yeah, right. There's, there, there are layers. And I think, you know, it really emphasizes for me the importance of getting females to tune into their menstrual health at an earlier age, that we don't just wait until they're in perimenopause or going through and beyond menopause um, until we start kind of dealing with some of these issues. Because really every month, you know, females, uh, whether whether they class themselves as athletes or not, we're getting this monthly progress report on how we're doing in terms of hormonal health. And it's up to us to listen to that um, and not take maybe some of that excess baggage with us into uh, perimenopause and menopause. So it's about listening to our bodies, tracking our menstrual cycle, tracking any signs and symptoms. There's a great body of research starting to be developed now about athletes hormonal health during the menstrual years during these reproductive years but i think we have to be really aware that when estrogen levels really start fluctuating in perimenopause and then they start they, they get, get quite high in the initial part of perimenopause because essentially at menopause really we're looking at a, a situation where the ovaries are not ovulating they're not producing um, eggs anymore and that has a couple of fallouts from that. In the initial part of this irregularity in terms of ovarian function, your brain wants to keep you ovulating and menstruating for as long as possible because estrogen particularly is super protective for heart health and bone health and brain health for women. Um, estrogen has about 400 different functions in the female body. So your brain really wants to keep things going for as long as possible for very good reason. And so we can get a lot of follicle stimulating hormone, quite high levels of estrogen as the brain tries to persuade the ovaries just one more period, just one more period. So estrogen levels can actually be quite high during perimenopause. But what happens is that even though these estrogen levels are high, the ovaries, if they're not ovulating, we start having these anovulatory cycles. So you might still be having periods. But if you're not ovulating, it means you're not producing progesterone to balance out the estrogen. So that can drive a lot of the symptoms that we associate with menopause, like the hot flashes and the mood changes and the 
breast tenderness and the sleep disturbances. Progesterone is a very calming hormone. It's a very sleep promoting hormone. But if you're not ovulating, you're not producing it. And what can happen is that as we move through perimenopause from this early perimenopause, we've got high estrogen, low progesterone. Then we move into late perimenopause where it's just not working anymore. So your brain, the pituitary gland says, fine, okay, we're not going to push you to produce anymore. And then estrogen levels fall. So now you've got low estrogen and low progesterone. And this is often where we start to see issues with tendons, with difficulty putting on and keeping muscle, um, as well as the bone health that we're, we're probably hearing more about. Um, and I think there is a tendency though to think of bone health as maybe an older person's problem. It's never too early or too late to start thinking about bone health. But I suppose particularly it's the muscle and tendon issues that we really see, see starting to become problematic, I think, for a lot of, uh, of women in their 50s, particularly. You know, there's a whole phenomenon called the 50-year-old shoulder. Uh, there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago looking at rotator cuff tendinopathies. We know that gluteal tendinopathy um, affects one mm. in four women in their 50s. Yeah. Uh, we see issues with posterior tendon, posterior tibial tendon tendinopathies. So we really need to be aware that these problems are likely, not inevitable, but they're they're more likely as we move into this low estrogen phase. But of course, there's lots that we can do about that. That was quite a lot at once, but I, I want to try and give people <laughs> a um, a timeline, right? So when yeah. do these changes in hormone levels start? Is this in your 50s or, you know, the, the sort of 12 months prior yeah. or like, is it a long time? So the average age of menopause around the world is 51. So we're really looking at perimenopause. If we're talking about perimenopause being the 10 to 15 years leading up to that, we're really looking at the, the mid to late 30s onwards. And then in the 40s, progressing towards, again, for, for most women, 51 is the, is the average, but it can be a couple of years either side of that. So I would say more likely to see it towards the later stages of perimenopause. So I'd say mid to late 40s into the 50s. Um, we have to balance out if we're talking about women in their 50s as well. We can't just blame everything on menopause either. You know, we've got to have this parallel stream of, yes, it could be menopause. It could be hormonally driven, but also, you know, we are aging as well. And so there's, you know, there are different considerations to be made there. But the, the building blocks for recovery are going to be quite similar. You know, we've got to look at at what type of exercise are we doing? What can we do to support the type of exercise we want to do with the type of exercise we need to do? And of course, looking at things like sleep, nutrition, stress management, all of those are going to be vital components as well. So it's a very much a, a holistic approach, understanding that maybe you can't tease out exactly what symptom is being driven by um hormones or or yeah. like it just be it, like if you get a tendinopathy or a gluteal tendinopathy as you were saying that that could just be a training error or it could be like a biomechanical thing it could be a strength thing but it could have a component or a contribution from changes in hormone levels that would make yes. the tendon less resilient less adaptable absolutely tendons love estrogen and, you know, we know tendons hate change and they love estrogen. So really kind of menopause can be that perfect storm, can't it? Because mm. all of those other factors can change as well. And then we take away some of the estrogen, you know, and there's been some interesting studies. We know uh, from Alison Grimaldi's work that, you know, there's really strong evidence that a, a targeted exercise program is going to be really beneficial for people who have gluteal tendinopathy. But there was a paper that came out last year as well that showing in women who were not obese that adding in menopausal hormone therapy as well as an, a targeted exercise program to deal with the gluteal tendinopathy actually got better results. So if you know that estrogen may be a player, it might not be the only player, but it may be something that we can control. Um, and even if we can't control it, we definitely need to respect it and to work with it. Yeah, and just to, for the listeners, when we're talking about gluteal tendinopathy, because that might not be as familiar, it's the, the pain that people get on the side of their hips. So it's like right on the outside of their hip. 
and it's usually you know worse when you sleep on it or worse when you like do a long run it'll hurt afterwards and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and it's often attributed to the um the bursa although in recent years we're starting to think maybe it's the gluteal tendon or maybe a contribution from both mm -hmm. and um that's the the it's it's a very common and stubborn problem oh um, it's really yeah. it's and as we said you know it affects one in four women in their 50s and what's What's frustrating about it is that it's often misdiagnosed as hip arthritis. You know, mm. the pain is is quite significant with it. But I, I feel like too many women, particularly runners that I've talked to about this, you know, maybe they go see their, their doctor because they're worried about it, or they see maybe a physio who isn't um, aware of it, and they're told it's hip arthritis, there's nothing you can do about it, you're just going to have to wait and get your hip replaced. And it's really important that we, you know, that we, we stay up to date with, with current thinking on these issues, that we, we are aware that with tendinopathies, there's definitely, it's a slow path for some people, but there is a path back to, to function again. Um, but we definitely see this spiking uh, for women in their 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what, if we were to take an overview of the various symptoms that these changes in hormone levels that are probably starting mid thirties, early forties, mm -hmm. we've got, we know we've touched on a few there. We've got for runners, particularly the, the tendon problems or so Achilles tendon, the um, patella tendon, the gluteal tendon have probably been the most likely. And then you mentioned as well, potentially bone problems. I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on the bone problems and then talk yeah. a little bit about some of the other symptoms that people might be getting that might show that they are having changes in their hormone levels associated with perimenopause. Sure. So with with bone health, um, again, estrogen is really protective of bones. Um, and it's why we do see a, a really rapid drop off in bone health in particularly the first few years after period stop. But we've got to balance that out with particularly with runners um, or with athletes who are participating in sports where appearance is really important, um, energy availability, because this relative energy deficiency in sport, it's not just an issue for younger athletes. We see this through perimenopause and into menopause as well. Essentially, if we're not taking in enough high quality nutrients to match our energy demands, our brain has to decide where it's going to spend its available energy. And a lot of runners think that running is enough to protect their bones moving forward. But we actually see some issues around this with energy availability um, and with runners developing things like stress fractures. So we're not just talking about osteoporosis and a fracture in a hip in a 70 year old woman. We're talking about uh, stress fractures, um, particularly in the metatarsals, but also issues with the with the tibia in the shin as well. So it's really important that for our runners, that they understand that running is great from a cardio point of view, but it's really only the first 50 impacts or so when you're running that are going to be bone stimulating. And mm -hmm. after that, the focus really changes. Your bone adapts to it. It's clever. Um, your bone needs novel stimuli to to keep remodeling, but it needs you to be taking in enough uh, nutrition wise as well. So you're taking in those bone building ingredients um, on a daily basis and you're looking at things like strength training, resistance training um, to complement your running. Um, and that's going to be beneficial from a, a muscle, tendon, bone, metabolic, you know, all the different parameters that we're interested in. Um, in terms of the other issues that we can see at menopause that may impact athletes, I suppose the, the two that I hear a lot about are metabolic changes. Um, estrogen really um, improves our sensitivity to insulin. So when estrogen levels start to drop off, we can become resistant to insulin and we need to produce a lot more of it. And that can drive weight gain, particularly around the center of the body. Um, stress, and again, lack of sleep is another driver of stress, that will also increase the hormone cortisol. And that's going to drive central weight gain as well. So for a lot of people who've been athletes 
for a long, long time, all of a sudden they might find they're carrying a little bit more weight centrally. And of course, the worst thing you can start to do then is restrict calories Mm. across the board because that's going to have an impact on all the other issues that we've discussed. Um, So metabolic health is certainly something that we need to look at and we need to be sure that we're talking to our athletes, particularly as we're encouraging them to do some more strength training, um, that they're taking in adequate protein into the mix. You still need carbs, but it's about choosing the quality of your carbs. So good, uh, you know, complex carbs that are going to release a nice steady level of blood sugar. And of course, the the other one that we hear a lot about at menopause um, is the pelvic health changes that can occur. Um, We know that for many women, once they're moving into this menopausal and postmenopausal zone, that's when they might start to notice issues with leaking, with running. We know that there can be quite a high incidence of urinary leakage, but also we're starting to see some research emerging around anal leakage as well, particularly in long distance runners. You know, we're, we're probably all familiar with, you know, runner's trots and, and that kind of terminology where endurance running can really dispose you to, to issues around diarrhea. Um, so you couple that with some compromised pelvic health because of changing hormone levels. So maybe the connective tissues are not giving you that passive support that you had. Maybe the pelvic floor muscles need a little bit more targeted work. And we also might start to see some issues with symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse, where again, we start to see maybe some of the organs in the pelvis, the uterus, the bladder, even the posterior part of the rectum, they start to descend uh, down and it might present like a feeling of bulging or heaviness in the vagina. So all of these things are manageable, um, again, with, with a targeted approach. So I suppose like the first step is really to to open up the conversation about them. And if you are having symptoms of leakage or feelings of heaviness or bulging, you know, that you do go see a good pelvic health physio who's going to be able to look at you, look at your current lifestyle and your goals and then come up with a program to help you deal with these issues. The last thing we want anybody to do is to stop exercising or stop moving. So it's all about troubleshooting and helping you meet your goals um, but pelvic health issues shouldn't really be a barrier for anybody participating in movement. Yeah, we're going to be having Emma Buckwell on in a couple of weeks to talk specifically Brilliant. about this because I know that's a, that's a that is a big topic and it's 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 complicated, right? So I want to be able to take a a deep dive yes. into that. The thing you said about the weight gain, I thought was quite mm. interesting, and this is something that I think is probably a lot more common than we realize is that you get these changes in hormone levels around that 35, early 40s age Mm -hmm. that causes an increase in abdominal fat storage, which then a woman might attribute to, you know, um, excess caloric intake. So they they run more and then Mm -hmm. they eat less. Mm-hmm. But the problem also was including the fact that they weren't getting enough calories in the first place. They weren't gaining abdominal weight because they were eating right. too much. Potentially, a contributing factor is that they weren't eating enough. And then they have start to have tendon and bone issues that mm-hmm. bring them to the physio, who we have to get them to run less because it hurts too much when they run and we need a bit of time to build them back up. Yeah. So now they've got reduced exercise levels. Um and it's almost a sort of perfect storm, really, and it's it's difficult to unpack. It is, and especially as well when you think about it, a lot of people do use running and exercise as a mental health support as mm. well. And then we're taking all of that away, you mm. know, um, which of course is going to add to stress, which increases cortisol levels, and cortisol uh, really promotes abdominal fat storage. So right. it just you know it's about breaking that cycle. And so what we need to be able to do, I think, first of all, is explain to people why we're why we're changing things around a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you haven't got good buy in from the people that we're working with, then it's just not going to work. And so the the magic bullet, I think, really, for all of this is to really look at what we can do strength training wise. Um, we've got to look at restorative work. So you know, getting stress management under control. So that means looking at sleep hygiene. What are you doing for for stress management? Because, you know, particularly for women in their late 30s and through their 40s, for many women, they're, they're that 
classic sandwich generation. They may, maybe they have kids, they have parents, they have work, they have a relationship, they've got a household. There's a lot of different stressors facing women in that life phase. And so we really want to be sure that, yes, running is great. Let's pick running as an example. Yes, running is great. But what else can we do that's going to help keep you running or get you back to running as soon as possible and support all of these other parameters in your life? So are you eating well? What does eating well mean to you? Um, Because I think sometimes as well, we have to look at the the convenience foods and the hyper-processed foods that maybe athletes are being driven towards energy drinks and energy bars and those can be quite irritating to the digestive system and that's not going to be good from a pelvic health perspective. So really taking a step back and taking a big picture overview. Okay, so what are you doing for strength training? What are you doing for restorative work? You know, do you have say a mindfulness practice or do you do any journaling or even breath work? Um let's really get you know focused on good sleep hygiene because that's a major issue for many women um going through perimenopause uh into menopause and beyond and if your sleep isn't dialed in it's really hard to get anything else right um it's just it's such an inflammatory um issue if you're not sleeping well but i've often found that if we can talk about how strength training really releases these um the myokines these anti-inflammatory compounds so you're producing your own anti-inflammatories and that's what we want to do and again we're working together you know the physio and the client working together to get towards a common goal it's not what the physio thinks you should be doing it's not that the client has a secret goal that they're you know they're secretly running or they're secretly eating the junk food we want to really just have this kind of clear line of communication so we're working together towards a common goal and Good protein intake, primarily plant-based protein, um, is really coming up in the research as as probably more beneficial for female athletes because that's going to improve digestive health because you're taking in a bit more fiber as well. Um, But if they are exclusively plant-based, then we also need to have a conversation maybe about things like vitamin B12 and I would say as well for the vegetarian and vegan athletes, who are maybe struggling with sleep, who are struggling with low mood, low energy, and picking up injuries, making sure that we're screening for things like anemia. Because in perimenopause, periods can get really, really heavy. And if you are, you know, if you haven't got a good iron intake and you're having super heavy, irregular periods, that can be a fast track towards anemia as well. So we want to be careful that we don't blame everything on menopause as well that we're we're mm. we're taking this big picture view um and seeing what what are the how can we control all the controllables that are available to us and we're not just blaming it all on the lack of estrogen so if i were to sum up if you're noticing some symptoms that you think may be associated with perimenopause so a lot of things that we might associate it with you know good healthy lifestyle practices such as um eating whole foods eating enough food to support your training uh, doing some regular strength training, which I blither on about endlessly on this podcast, so people know how I feel about that. Um, and, you know, man- I don't want to say managing stress is all, it's a very easy thing to do, but being conscious about how mm. stress is affecting you and how you might be able to more effectively engage with the world so you're not bringing needless stress to you and maybe getting some help with that if you if you need it. You mentioned sleep hygiene. Like, if sleep is a a difficulty, I would say that's, Mm -hmm. you know, way up there on the list of things to to help with, right? Because if if people can't sleep, they can't adapt to their training, they can't um, recover, they can't maintain all those other healthy things that we were talking about or benefit from them. If someone's having trouble with sleep, where where should they start? The very first thing we're going to talk about if if I'm talking to somebody about sleep is alcohol. Because okay. a lot of people, if they are not doing well with stress management, they they may be relying on having a glass of wine or, you know, to unwind in the evening and get to sleep. But there's there's some issues with this because the sleep that you have after you've had alcohol is not a high quality sleep and you're more likely to wake up during the night. Um, alcohol is also, um, it's going to be problematic from 
from a number of different perspectives, but it's also estrogenic and not in a good way. Um, it's usually fairly dense in calories as well. Um, and we don't want to have that as a crutch for, for managing stress because what can happen is you're having the glass of wine or two to unwind in the evening. You're not getting a good night's sleep because maybe you're waking up at two because it's disrupting your REM sleep. Or maybe you have to get up and go to the loo because it can also be a diuretic. So you have to go empty your bladder. So that's disrupting your sleep. And then the alarm goes off at six the following morning and now you're really struggling. So you're stressed about that. That's going to dump mm. a lot of cortisol into your system. Now you're going to start maybe depending on the caffeine and the sugar to get you going. You have a little crash maybe around three in the afternoon. So you have more caffeine. And caffeine has a half-life of about six hours. So six hours after your last cup of coffee, you still have 50% of that caffeine going through your system. So if people are using a lot of alcohol and caffeine to manage themselves, that's one of the first things we're going to have a conversation about. If somebody is in perimenopause and they're not sleeping well, they, they're maybe they're waking up and they're having you know, hot flash at night, night sweats. One of the simplest things that we can do is to maybe make sure that we're having a snack before you go to bed that has some protein and some complex carbs in it. So we've got a nice steady blood sugar during the night. Because what can happen is if you're having, say, a big bowl of spaghetti for your dinner and then you're going to bed maybe an hour and a half later, um, your blood sugar can crash and then you get this spike of insulin and that can wake you up and then you have the hot flash. And then, right. you know, all of the, the dominoes kind of fall into disarray. So making sure that you're having, you know, a high quality snack, you know, protein based, maybe with some complex carbs before you go to bed. And that can help you get through the night. Um, you want a nice cold, dark room. Um, so lots of people benefit from switching to a much lighter tog duvet or even just having a top sheet on their bed. Um, and then doing a brain dump of your stressors before you get into bed. So writing it down and then, you know, I find physically writing it down with a pen and paper much more effective than typing out a note on your phone because we do want to mm -hmm. try and avoid the blue light from our devices before we go to sleep. So physically writing it down, pen and paper, and then snapping that shut and parking it for the night, reading a book. Your brain, our brains really love habit and ritual as well. So I don't know if you remember back when you were small, Matthew, but, you know, maybe you had like a little bedtime routine, you know, it might yep. have been a bedtime story and getting tucked into bed. And our brains recognize that and they recognize that when certain things happen on a regular basis, like, oh, we must be getting ready for sleep now. Mm. So it could be something like doing some gentle yoga stretches, doing some breath work. Um, our sense of smell is very much tied into the emotional center in our brain as well. So it could be something like putting on maybe a little bit of lavender essential oil, because once our, you know, we, we know that smell triggers memory and can trigger a, a subconscious reaction. So if you just use a little bit of lavender oil at night and you use it every night, your brain starts to associate that with part of the wind down ritual to get us into sleep. And then, you know, we really just want to be aware of the power of habit carrying through that we're going to bed at the same time every night, whether it's Monday or Sunday, whether we're at home, at work, um, you know, or, or away on, on holiday. Um, our brains love that power of routine. So going to bed and getting up at the same time every morning can mm -hmm. really just bookend a good night's sleep. So a couple of things there, but sometimes I think the things that are are they might seem very obvious are actually, you know, they're, they're obvious for a reason because they're, they're quite effective. So even to take two or three of those, but I would always start with alcohol and caffeine, to be honest. Mm, yeah. I mean, that's, that's super helpful. Actually. I don't often talk about a lot of those and there's some fairly simple things. And I don't, again, I don't want to minimize the sort of alcohol and caffeine thing. I know myself, I've had trouble with using those as a sort of self medicine when I'm stressed, you know, and I, and I get that uh, if stress is a component of the perimenopausal symptoms anyway, and then, you know, you're having trouble sleeping and alcohol does tend to help you get to sleep, even if it actually worsens your sleep in the in the long run. And then if you're waking up tired, and you have to work and you have children at this age range, right? Th uh, late 30s, early 40s, usually your kids mm -hmm. are fairly young, often these days. So there are a lot of work. And you're often working, you know, as a, uh, you know, in a job as well. So 
you're yeah. quite stressed <laughs> and then you, you drink a bunch of coffee to get through the day and then at the end of the day yeah. you're sort of frazzled and you drink some alcohol to sort of help you wind down Calm and down, get yourself unwind yeah but that becomes the routine that you were mentioning you know that's like okay well I can't go to bed until I've had my glass of wine I know I've certainly mm-hmm. had that developed before where you know that's just part of the routine and trying to start with getting rid of the things that are spoiling your sleep work cycle or minimizing them so the alcohol and the caffeine and then from there trying to replace them with some more helpful habits or more helpful Mm -hmm. routines so reading um i like that brain dump idea that's nice for for people who are sort of ruminating um Mm. and not and not sleeping well because they're dwelling on you know we go through these sort of fairly mundane things that are sort of on our mind and they can keep us awake but I, yeah. I like the idea of putting them in a book and sort of closing it. So you're like, okay, well, I've thought about that now. I don't need to go through it like 300 times <laughs> before yeah. I go to sleep. I'll, I'll park it for um, tonight. I'll, I'll come back to it tomorrow. And just it calms yeah. the brain down and stops stops the cycle. It's like, okay, she knows that it's on our mind. You know, she knows that it's important, but it's in the notebook <laughs> and we'll deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so there's some really good t- tips. So if you're having some of these symptoms, troubles with injuries, um, trouble sleeping, um, well, what are the other symptoms to look out for? So you, you said pelvic health stuff. Uh, does this yeah. do these changes in hormone cause changes in mood and and other such things? Uh, well, yeah, hormones can cause changes in mood, but then also if we're not sleeping, of course, that's going to be a huge oh, mood yeah, okay. uh, issue. If we're stressed because we're still exercising and we're still eating the same thing that we've done for the past ten years, and now we're gaining weight with it, that can be a stressor. But the hormones itself are going to affect our mood because, as we said at the, you know when we stop ovulating you might still be menstruating so you might still be having a period but if you're not ovulating in the middle of that menstrual cycle you're not producing progesterone and estrogen gets all the attention when it comes to menopause Um, but progesterone is this super important calming hormone it's anti-anxiety it's sleep promoting Um, so when it's not there to balance out our estrogen Um, estrogen kind of runs wild. Um, The analogy that I often use when I'm talking about the menstrual cycle is that estrogen is very much a growth hormone. And we need estrogen, for example, you know, for breast development, for for bone and heart and, you know, uh, brain health. Estrogen is really important when it comes to building muscle. It's an anabolic hormone, just like testosterone. But estrogen is like putting fertilizer on your lawn. And then progesterone is like the lawnmower that keeps the growth in check. So if we're not producing progesterone because of perimenopause, we're not ovulating and into menopause, we're certainly not ovulating anymore. Then those fluctuations in estrogen can really, you know, they can cause those heavy, crampy periods that we were talking about. They can cause the breast tenderness. But it's the lack of progesterone often that can cause that kind of jittery moodiness that... um, just really very low tolerance for anybody else's nonsense that uh, (laughs) many of us might be going through. But again, then you layer that with calorie deprivation, sleep deprivation, all those other stressors that are going on as well. Um, it, It really just, it can become this perfect storm. And now you can't run because, you know, you've got hip pain, you know, and that was your, your pressure release valve. So it's, It's great to be able to zoom in and look at the specifics, but we always have to zoom out and look at the whole person and their whole story and all the different facets that are contributing to this because all of these different things get poured into the bucket and what's the one thing that, you know, the final straw that causes the bucket to overflow into Mm. into rage or, you know, unmanageable stress. So we really want to be aware of that. Um, And again, it's controlling the controllables, but understanding the different issues that can contribute to all of this I think is really important sorry Michelle I lost you for a second there Um, so um, if someone is you know I think I think part of the the issue with managing something like this that has symptoms and and things that are uh, cropping up in different say areas of their health is Mm. and i I know i've been guilty of this is you know someone comes to me as a physio with an achilles tendon pain and i like treat the achilles tendon and then they go to their doctor and they have 
anemia and they treat the anemia and then yes. they go to you know a psychologist and say that they are you know having having trouble sleeping and they they feel really stressed and then they sort of treat that you know who is i think it's a difficult question because i'm not sure that there is one person i think the one person that they need to go to is themselves and then yeah. look at these other people as sort of resources and and they put it together or or do you think it's it's better to sort of talk with a specific health professional maybe a doctor maybe a physio about the whole picture how how do you recommend people approach it if they are thinking well these this is ringing some bells but you know who, who do i talk to about this you know well i think you know in an ideal world we'd have we'd have everybody tracking their menstrual cycles you know and being aware of okay. the the different you know i hesitate to use the word symptoms because we don't want to medicalize what is a perfectly normal transition in a woman's life but being aware of some of the signs that hormones are are not as happy and healthy and balanced as they could or should be so that would be ideal and i think again there's such a huge variety in in doctors awareness of the full spectrum of hormonal health and menopausal health i think that is improving but i think you know i was talking to somebody just uh just recently and they're they're 44 so they're you know 45 once you're over 45 we say there's generally no point in doing blood work for menopause because it's assumed that if you're over 45 that's what's driving a lot of this you know that that would be the logical conclusion but of course women can go through menopause early prematurely and they're definitely going to need some help hormonally to protect bone health and all the other issues that are coming down the line but you know talking to somebody who's being seen by a, a gynecologist and they're on a hormonal protocol and then maybe they go to their gp who says oh no you're too young to be on hormone therapy you know you, you need to come off that that's dangerous for you or they're operating off old information you know that came out 20 years ago with the women's health initiative you know it's going to give you breast cancer it's super risky for you so in an ideal world we would be really tuned into our own health and tracking our own monthly cycles and our own signs and symptoms and being able to correlate that to sleep and nutrition and stress and movement and again ideally then we'd be able to go to a, a gp and again hand on heart i have nothing but respect for for gps because they have to know a little bit about everything but but menopause is an issue that will affect 50 percent of the people on this planet so it's not a niche topic you know <laughs> it's it's really not a specialist subject it's something that yeah. will affect literally 50 percent of people on the planet so it's up to it's up to the our medical colleagues to rise up and, and become aware of that that women's health again it shouldn't be such a, a, a neatly boxed off afterthought. And then it's up to us to, to learn how to advocate for ourselves. And if we're not happy with the health that we're get the help that we're getting about our health, then we do feel empowered to get a second opinion. So mm. yes, GP, yes, gynecologist would probably be best I would I would love to say, you know, a good women's health physio as well. Mm. Um hopefully we'll be aware of these because again, looking at the, the changes that are happening from a menstrual through those maternal changes because that's going to have a strong impact on pelvic health in later life, uh, obviously. For many women in menopause, <clears throat> they may have had obstetric issues when they've had their babies, but because once they return postnatally and they start ovulating again, they have enough estrogen and progesterone in their system that they can get away with it. They can compensate for those changes, but then we take away the estrogen and progesterone, and it's often in their 50s that women's obstetric history catches up with them. So a good women's health physio, I would say, would be a really, really important part of, of any menopausal athlete's um, support system. Yeah, I think that that's my bias, certainly. I mean, I'm a physiotherapist. I'm not a, a pelvic health specialist, but I Everyone's have Everyone's got pelvic health pelvic... issues, Matthew. <laughs> I Boys have pelvic health, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said specialist. I didn't say that I, uh, I'm not aware of it or Excellent. when to uh, treat it or refer especially. But for yeah. the pelvic health specialist, or sometimes they have been called like women's health, but I think that the term has become more pelvic health. We're evolving, um, but yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that physiotherapist with a special interest in these type of issues, I think personally, for a couple of reasons. One is they will 
spend a long time with you usually a lot longer than mm-hmm. doctors have so they can often uncover the the myriad of symptoms that you can get and then be and then sort of put it together and then once you both know then you can you know okay i can talk to my doctor about i've got this 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 and this yeah. these all may be hormone related and so i think that for me is a really good person i almost tell people to think of it like a dentist or someone it's not mm-hmm. someone that you go and see once when you're having some leaking it's someone you see sort of periodically through your life and you call them or you email them and you you ask them questions you check in with them so they can help guide you through the 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 sort of the journey i guess through through this period yeah. the you did mention there you know you you talked a lot about of natural things that sound like just generally good healthy things to do anyway for everybody so they're not going to have negative side effects to you know increase your plant-based protein or get better sleep or drink less alcohol right these things are going to be good side effects generally you did then mention hormone therapy so i wanted to ask you about that and this is certainly something that a lot of people have reservations about and they don't know if it's right for them or not could you tell tell us a little bit about that and when to talk to your doctor about whether this might be appropriate for you absolutely um so yeah really the whole conversation around menopausal hormone therapy has changed over the past couple of years um generally the thinking was that you wanted to take the lowest dose for the shortest period of time um because of the assumed risks associated with it particularly around breast cancer but we actually what we know now is that there's more risk associated with alcohol intake and being overweight when it comes to breast cancer than taking hormone therapy. So when I'm having these comments, you know, it's it's just it's to bring that level of awareness that you know I, by no means am I, you know, a passionate advocate of abstinence completely, you know, but it's about knowing what's, what is actually risky for you and what's not. And alcohol is a high risk behavior for women going through menopausal health because it's the only thing that we have that's really strongly associated with breast cancer, far more so than hormone therapy. So with systemic hormone therapy, what we now know is that it's far more preferable to use hormone therapy uh, transdermally rather than orally. So a patch or a gel rather than taking a pill for your hormone mm-hmm. therapy. It's about ha- you know taking some estrogen uh, supplementation to bolster up your declining levels. Um, if you still have a uterus, you're going to want to take some progesterone substitute as well. So the estrogen usually comes in a patch or a gel. The progesterone, you're usually going to have to take a pill with that. And for about 50% of women that's enough to take care of all of their bothersome menopausal symptoms. And it's going to be very beneficial when it comes to preserving good bone health. For the other 50% or so, that's not going to be enough to target their pelvic health symptoms. And so, you know, we talked about bladder leakage, we talked about prolapse symptoms, but one of the other things that can happen to uh, pelvic health around menopause is that a lot of women notice that they have um, a lot of dryness and irritation and thinning of the tissues. And they start to develop these recurrent UTIs. And particularly for women who are engaging in like running or cycling, tissues can get really, really sore and bothered um, in around the vulva and the perineum. Even for women who aren't producing enough lubrication for intercourse or just even exercising themselves. And this is where topical uh, estrogen can be super beneficial. And that's actually even appropriate for somebody who's been through breast cancer treatment because there's minimal systemic absorption of topical vulvar estrogen into the system. So it's a great safe way to resolve a lot of the pelvic health issues that we can see with menopause. Um, It's, 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 it's safe. You know, this, what we know about topical estrogen applied uh, vaginally and around the vulva, because it's not being absorbed, we're not going to have that, uh, the issue that maybe women who've been through breast cancer are going to have. Hormone therapy is not going to be recommended generally for somebody who's been through an estrogen positive breast cancer because of the potentially increased risk. But we know that it can be such a game changer in terms of getting your sleep back on track again, in terms of getting the hot flashes back under control, because those can be hugely disruptive for people 
not only on a day to day level, but even in a work, you know, in a work setting, you're going to give a big presentation and all of a sudden you're having these really intense hot flashes. So while my my toolbox is very much focused on lifestyle and looking at the food, you know, cutting out the irritants, whether they're bladder irritants or whether it's, you know, eating a lot of hot or spicy or dairy or caffeine foods that can trigger hot flushes. I'm looking at the big picture here, but it doesn't have to be lifestyle or hormone therapy because what's going to work really best for a lot of women is lifestyle and hormone therapy. And so it's really to to make sure that we're we're doing some myth busting around the safety. Is hormone therapy suitable for everybody? No. But for most women, it will be a safe choice to make. And there are lots of different types that they can try as well. So what works for one woman might not work for somebody else. So it's like getting this kind of tailored approach, which I think we, we should all have, to our health care. Um, but also reminding women that, you know, you have to do the work as well and really looking at what you need to change nutrition wise. What do we need to change exercise wise? And again, like really getting your strength training dialed in because that's what's going to help improve your insulin resistance, help you manage your weight gain, as well as as working on the muscle and tendon and bone health issues that we've talked about. I think that's a, a fantastic sum up to leave it on, Michelle. That was a, a nice sort of going from the medical and then through into the more uh, general health holistic things that people can do. And I think we've hit all of the, or most of the symptoms that might be... Um, <laughs> you know, more prevalent in runners, particularly around perimenopause. Uh, just to, to sign off with, is there anything you'd like to leave people with? Or um, would you like to direct them to anything that you've produced that they might want to, that they also might be interested in? Oh, thanks. So I would say the first thing is, is be an expert on yourself. You know, I'm a big fan of tracking everything you know if you're still menstruating that's great track your cycles there are apps or just a pen and paper but track your sleeping track you know any injuries that are happening track what you're eating track your stress levels and then see if you can correlate that with any troublesome symptoms that you might be having as well because it's one of the strongest pieces of backup that we can take with us if we're going to a medical appointment if you can say well look here's what's been happening over the past three months mm -hmm. you know i've noticed that this affects this this not so much but i've noticed say you know my periods are getting a little further apart maybe they're getting heavier um i i became a, a vegetarian about five years ago I'm feeling, you know, really, really tired and slow and I'm picking up these injuries. What do you think we should do? So that it's very much between you and your medical team, whether it's your, your GP, your gynae or your physio, you're the captain of the ship, you know, and they're your support staff, but you want to give them all the information that you can so that they can help you appropriately. And to not be afraid to just accept this as a normal part of getting older. Um, you know, pelvic health issues, whether it's painful intercourse or bladder leakage or prolapse symptoms, all of those things, you know, we know from the research that pelvic health issues are a barrier for one in two women participating in exercise. And wow. we know, yeah, it's huge. And unfortunately, you know what, that was from a study that came out, I think, in 2021. And it pretty much replicated studies that you can go back and look at from 20 years ago. So we mm. need to do a better job with helping people with their pelvic health and i think the first thing is you know bringing it out of the shadows you know and talking about how bladder leakage might be common but it's not normal and there's almost mm. always something that we can do about it but that you know kind of dryness or irritation that a lot of menopausal runners or athletes also experience you don't have to put up with pain or discomfort at any life stage ideally but certainly not going through menopause there's so much that we can do to help you live well that's a very optimistic note to end it on. If someone wants to hear more from you, and I will link to some other episodes that you've done on other podcasts uh, for people who want to listen to you more, because I've learned a lot from those interviews. Um, is there anywhere that you would suggest they, you know, either follow you or do you have like a uh, website courses, things like that, that sure. they might be interested in? Thanks, Matthew. So, um, yeah, the best place to find me is on Instagram. So it's Michelle Lyons underscore Muley Eberty. And everybody always asks, well, what does Muley Eberty mean? It's an old English word that means the art and state of being a woman. So I think we need to celebrate women's health 
and just really have these conversations. And my website is celebratemuliebrity.com. Okay, I will link in the description since it's a little tricky to spell. <laughs> then, <laughs> Thanks. I'll also put a link in there to your Instagram. And uh, I have read tons of your bo- blogs and listened Aww. to a bunch of your podcast Thanks. interviews and learned a lot. So I, I would suggest uh, runners check out the links in the description to to learn more from you because we only really um, scratch the surface today. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and talk to us today. So thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording there. Super.